It's really a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker for this conference, um, Dr. Mustafa Aran. Um, we uh, spent a lot of time, effort, and energy to recruit uh, Dr. Aran from University of uh, Minnesota, and uh, took us two years. And, uh, but uh, we're so happy that we landed uh, really a giant in the field of advanced uh, endoscopy, and uh, so we're really excited about uh, having him here. Um, and uh, we owe Jack Lake another favor. <laughs> so, um, and uh, just working with uh, Mustafa for a couple months, you realize that he has really, you know, kind of changed the whole, you know, uh, structure and uh, um, mentality of this clinical service and being incredibly uh, responsive and uh, thoughtful about very, very challenging clinical problems and it's just tremendous uh, to work with. And uh, I uh, really think that is a great, you know, resource for both us and also for all of you in the community uh, that uh, Mustafa is here and uh, offer, offer you the, the skill and expertise and also the, uh, the whole approach to advanced endoscopy. And uh, so I'm very delighted uh, to be able to invite him even before he came, that I thought about this already, uh, to talk about advanced endoscopy, endoscopic ultrasound uh, in liver disease. Okay, Mustafa. Thank you, Francis. Um, it's, I'm humbled and honored to be here. I, I would like to extend my gratitude to everybody involved, especially Francis, Bilal, and the entire group at UCSF. Um, coming from Minnesota, it is exciting to be here. Um, the, the, the tie is very, very strong, and every for all of you who know Jack Lake, every conversation used to start with, when I was at UCSF, <laughs> So next time I see him, I will say, at UCSF, <laughs> we do this. So the other component to this is, of course, I was given a topic which um, it's like saying to your child, you can go into the candy store, but you can only have two candies. So it's such a big topic, and I tried to do justice to it. I hope this is useful, but feel free to um, let me know if this didn't really hit the spot. So the role of the advanced endoscopist, um, there is a role for diagnostic uh, purposes. Uh, when it's obvious malignancy, obviously we can play a role oftentimes with EUS with sampling, plus minus ERCP. Um, specifically when it comes to biliary strictures um, and indeterminate strictures in PSC, we seem to play a role of continuity as well as uh, diagnosis and therapeutic role, um, which, which can be challenging. Um, and to be part of a very robust hep hepatology program, it's, it's exciting to, to be a part of that sort of role. We, of course, have the therapeutic role, which is both pre-transplantation and post-transplantation, which is a somewhat different topic, which oftentimes involves primarily ERCP procedures, which I will touch on, though I won't go into this because this in itself is a, a sort of big topic. And then evolving role and uh, future directions. And the exciting thing for us in the field of advanced endoscopy is the role in terms of EUS. Um, a lot of therapeutic EUS, but also diagnostic EUS. Um, bill restrictors are tough. Um, if it's not obviously malignant, then it's not obviously benign, and you're always wondering, is this benign or malignant? Um, the benign causes um, primary closing cholangitis, PSC, inflammatory, stones, radiation, intraarterial chemotherapy, radiation, acute and chronic pancreatitis, and you're always wondering, well, is this truly benign or is this a malignant stricture? Necrosis, pancreatic necrosis and pseudocyst can cause obstruction. Post-cholecystectomy strictures, autoimmune, and the list is longer. I will not talk much about autoimmune uh, disease because uh, Dr. Peters is going to be talking about that too, though I will touch on that a bit. 
And then malignant strictures, obviously, in the field of hepatology, um, cholangiocarcinoma, whether it's uh, in the setting of PSC or, or outside of that. And then secondary disease, whether it's metastatic or um, local extension. And the cl clinical pre presentation, obviously, does not follow those rules. So occasionally, if it's not malignant, we'll be, it'll be pretty straightforward and we'll be able to figure out benign diseases, though sometimes that can be tough. You have the, the ongoing saga with PSC patients of this potential for malignancy, and you're always wondering, am I missing something, or am I, am I on spot here? And then the truly determinates, which malignant, should be considered malignant un, until proven otherwise. Um, and here I will mention that cholangiocarcinoma and IgG4 seem to have this overlap that um, sometimes, in my experience, seems to get overlooked, and patients do get diagnosed with, in quotes, autoimmune cholangiopathy, get, you know, have the appropriate antibody tests, and it turns out down the line that it's actually cholangiocarcinoma. And the reason is because 15% of them will be IgG4 positive. Beyond that, I'll let Dr. Peters talk some more about this. So evaluate, I'll, I'll start with some indeterminate strictures and move on to PSC. Um, obviously, the clinical clues and clinical context, the ANA, IgG4, CA99, about 50% of patients with uh, autoimmune cholangiopathy may have a positive ANA. Um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of good quality non-invasive imaging. Um, as advanced endoscopists, we get carried away and want to put in the scope and do something. But we can learn a lot and target our procedures based on what's actually there already without having to touch the patient. So high resolution CT, MRI, MRCP, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Of course, the role of EUS uh, in evaluation of strictures, lesions, nodes, and then ERCP, both diagnostic uh, as well as therapeutic. Having said that, I will say that for the most part, ERCP should be always considered to be a therapeutic procedure. The only exception to the rule is diagnostic ERCP in the setting of indeterminate strictures as well as PSC, which in the form of uh, indeterminate strictures. So here's an example of a patient who had an EUS at a different hospital. This is prior to, where I, uh, before, prior to me arriving here. Had a history of some sort of a gastric surgery, thought to have a mass with biliary obstruction. Um, and actually, when somebody dug the operative reports, found that she had a hepaticojejunostomy, and this mass that was causing biliary obstruction actually was a large stone at a stenotic uh, benign stricture. MRCP is great for evaluating for malignancy in terms of cholangiocarcinoma. Here you have a proximal bile duct stricture, very nicely delineating the intrahepatic tree above it as well as the common bile duct below it. So it helps us both figuring out what needs to be done as well as how to target therapy in terms of ERCP. The role of endoscopic ultrasound, um, it's a dynamic evaluation of the biliary tree. I'm sure you're all aware of how EUS works. I'll, I'll show you a couple of pictures. Um, it's a high resolution uh, study compared to our conventional transect, uh, cross-sectional studies, we can get up to 0.1 millimeter resolution versus 1.5 to 2.5 uh, millimeters with CT and MRI. It's much higher sensitivity for masses on repeated studies in terms of evaluation for uh, indeterminate strictures. And it allows sampling uh, with fine needle aspiration, uh, including of bile duct masses. And the caveat here is that it is contraindicated in proximal strictures like the one I showed earlier um, because you can actually cause seeding of, of the peritoneal cavity. And so for distal strictures and pancreatic cancers, it's considered okay, but patients who may be considered for transplantation, uh, proximal, as well as even for resection, proximal biopsies, trans, a, a transgastric or transduodenal by EUS um, are, not, are not considered the right approach. We can evaluate masses locally, so for T, T classification, and of course, we can evaluate for metastatic disease, whether it's lymph nodes or uh, for, for liver lesions. Um, findings, however, may be nonspecific in the setting of benign disease, and I'll show you some, some data for this. So EUS as a diagnostic 
tool in determining cholangiocarcinoma in the setting of indeterminate biliary strictures. Um, this was a sort of review from GIE, the ASC organization. And the main thing here is that EUS, depending on the studies, can be sensitive up to 80%, 90% of the time for indeterminate biliary strictures in the setting of cholangiocarcinoma to make a diagnosis. But one has to be careful, again, not to sample the proximal strictures um, because of the risk of seeding. Having said that, the sensitivity drops down for proximal strictures anyway. It, it's not as sensitive in the setting of proximal st strictures as opposed to um, distal strictures. So we're still left with that hyalur patient who has obstruction, jaundice, and we are not quite sure what, what to do. That's where the role of ERCP comes in. Um, and here are our different choices. We have brush cytology. So we do an ERCP, we put a brush up there. We can take biopsies. We have fish. We have other modalities to evaluate the cells, digital image analysis of the cells that we obtain from cytology. Um, cholangioscopy, where we can actually put a camera up into the duct and take a look. An intraductal ultrasound, and the list goes on which is a reflection on the difficulty of both making a diagnosis and the limitations of all the different modalities that we have. Because no, none of these modalities has really stood out to become the preferred modality, both in the setting of indeterminate strictures as well as in the setting of, um, of PSC. So just some briefly some images. Here in the, on the leftmost image we have a brush that's being literally brushed up and down into the stricture to get cells that are sent for cytology. You can increase the yield, and I'll show you the yields by adding biopsies at the same time. Intrahepatic biopsies can be difficult with biopsy forceps. People have also aspirated bile and sent that for, for cytology. Um, at the same time, the brushings that have been obtained may be sent for fish, um, and that essentially uh, the, the sort of the premise for that test is that tumor cells will have an increase or decrease in the number of chromosomes oftentimes. And so there are specific um, probes that, are, that light up uh, in, in terms of fluorescence labeling in the setting of cancer cells. And these, we look for those uh, probes to light up. And if there's an increase in the number of chromosomes, that may represent the presence of tumor. And there are several studies um, in this. The, the traditional uh, fish analysis that has been done is actually using a, a test that is, was developed for, for urologic malignancies, and that's the Eurovision fish test, um, which is the third column, uh, set of columns in the, in the diagram. And the sensitivity of, of that is about 40 to 50 percent. Um, there's a big drive in the Mayo Clinic for this test, and they recently published a study which is quoted here where they have come up with a pancreatic biliary panel in the setting of cancers, pancreatic as well as cholangios, where with their newer panel they have increased, been able to show an increase in sensitivity to about 60%. The difficulty here is that your, your incremental increase from a positive cytology to a atypical cytology is significant anyway. And what does fish really add is maybe another 10%, but it's still a, it's a step in the right direction. With all these tests, they're very specific. So if, if they're negative, uh, then the chance of missing a malignancy is, is low. So moving on to cholangioscopy, several different sort of approaches. You can have the mother-daughter scope approach um, where you have a scope that goes through the working channel of the ERCP scope and into the duct. Various vendors have their own sort of uh, proprietary technology, and then you can try and get a pediatric upper scope into the bile duct, which can be quite challenging. Um, the one that is take, taken off the most is the single operator cholangioscopy system by Boston Scientific, um, which is also known uh, as Spyglass, with now their latest version being the Spyglass DS. Here's a picture of spyglass. You have the ERCP scope. You have a spy catheter up into the bile duct. And then we can, uh, A, use that to assess the mucosa with a small picture shown at the top, and I'll show you more, and then also obtain biopsies. The issue with biopsies is that the working channel is less than two millimeters, so the biopsy forceps are small, and compared to standard biopsy forceps, 
the bytes that we get are going to be smaller. Um, here's an example of the latest um, version of the SPI. The resolution has improved significantly. It's a single catheter system. You can actually clearly see inside the duct. You can advance your biopsy forceps and then target your biopsies um, and, and hopefully get, get a diagnosis. And then there are the specialized intraductal modalities, um, the long list that I showed you, confocal laser under microscopy, OTC, narrowband imaging. And all of these have shown to have some value. The main issue is that there again, the sensitivity is in that 50 to 60 percent at the most. And uh, so it's hard to really get, get to know whether how much value they truly add. So here's a, a, a relatively recent sort of review of the different sensitivities and specificities in the sort of the yield of these tests. And if you look at the sensitivity, again, it can be anywhere from 30 percent to as high as 80 percent in the setting of introductal ultrasound or planjoscopy, though that is that is very selected series, small patients, and realistically, the introductal ultrasound alone doesn't give you a diagnosis. You have to have a tissue diagnosis, and so it's not going to be very helpful. Specificity, on the other hand, whenever you get a positive, it's, it's good. And just for the simpletons like myself, we always need to remind ourselves, you know, if it's a sensitive test, if it's negative, you can rule out the disease. And if it's a specific test, you can, uh, if, uh, if it's positive, um, then it's, it's definitely there. Um, and there are the p p positive predictive values and negative predictive values. The bottom line is we're not quite there with any of these modalities to say this is the preferred test, though we may be moving towards uh, uh, introductory evaluation with spy glass and taking directed biopsies. So what about PSC in all this? This you guys already know. The only reason I wanted to show this slide was that we really should not be doing diagnostic ERCP for, for PSC unless absolutely necessary based on the two guidelines that we have that unless the MRCP is not suggestive and the, and the um, liver biopsy is not suggestive and we're still asking questions, we can consider doing an ERCP. Though I still have doubts as to how much helpful that can be versus just the MRCPs with the quality of high resolution MRCPs we have. Um, indications for endoscopic evaluation and, and treatment in PSC are primarily symptomatic biliary disease when their patients either jaundice, pruritus, progressive sort of disease. There's a obvious dominant stricture on imaging, usually MRCP, and whenever there is a concern for clangial carcinoma, and clearly these entities overlap, so it's, it's not one or the other, they all sort of seem to come hand in hand. Principles, um, for anybody who's in the audience already does this, you, you know, for all of you, I'm sure you know, antibiotics reduce the risk of cholangitis, avoid unnecessary injection, balloon dilate the strictures and avoid putting in stents because um, stents lead to infectious complications and to brush and ideally biopsy dominant strictures if we can reach them. Avoid doing repeated ERCPs if they are uh, patients are otherwise doing well. There is no data to suggest that they should be brought in every certain amount of weeks or months and to perform ERCP. They can be followed with MRCP, but again, the guidelines are not clear as to what the time frame for that should be. Um, and a lot of us who are involved in, their, in the patient's care will sometimes do an annual MRCP, though oftentimes this is in the hands of, of the hepatology colleagues. So PSC and cholangiocarcinoma, this is the real tough one. But we need to have a high level of suspicion. Oftentimes evaluation is nonspecific or negative, uh, but that doesn't mean it's, it's ruled out. Again, clear clinical deterioration, persistent strictures, and an elevated CA99 may all be suggestive. And generally speaking, I think as I speak to people around the country who do this, primarily this is the sort of our approach, low threshold to repeat imaging, EUS, if there is abnormality, to assess, to look for obvious metastatic disease, and then ERCP with brush cytology plus likely fish, biopsy, and then nowadays moving on to spyglass. This is a patient actually that Francis and I are co-managing. With PSC, you can see intrahepatic ductal dilation here. 
uh, right anterior left lobe here, um, who has significantly progressive disease, and she has us worried because, again, I feel that she has an underlying malignancy. I could be wrong, but you never know. I did an EUS, and all I see is a thickened bile duct wall. This is a bile duct. The lumen is about maybe one to two millimeters, and there's this nonspecific thickening of the bile duct wall. Um, did an ERCP, and actually, to my surprise, the lumen was bigger than I thought it would be, but it's this diffuse filling defects in the lumen, which are nonspecific. Um, cleaned out the duct, the distal bile duct, the gallbladder still intact, you see that filling. We had a stricture on the right uh, side that we dilated, and then multiple intrahepatic strictures on the le in the left um, lobe of the liver that we balloon dilated. Brought her back, did a spyglass yesterday, and I apologize that my video recorder didn't work yesterday, but I was able to get stills, and I have this nodularity inside the duct, main bile duct. I have some stone degree, uh, debris and fragments, um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what this is. Is this just progressive PSC or is this cholangio? So the best I could do was look at it, say that it's abnormal, and took lots of biopsies. Um, that was $3,000 later with the spy of DS. Um, so what about the role of sort of cholangiocarcinoma in EUS? I mean, where do we stand with this? So this was an interesting study from the Mayo Clinic again. Um, what they did was everybody who was diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma, uh, as part of their protocol, underwent uh, an e, uh, with, which was considered unresectable um, and was being evaluated for transplantation, underwent an EUS at the Mayo Clinic. And of the 47 patients with unresectable hyaloclangiocarcinoma, uh, 12 of the 47 patients had no lymph nodes on CT or MRI, but all 47 patients had lymph nodes um, a total of 70 on EUS, and nine of those 70 came back positive, and eight of them were in patients with PSC. So the whole message was that anybody with unresectable cholangiocarcinoma that's being evaluated for, for transplantation should have an EUS, and if you see nodes, you should biopsy those nodes, because even if they may look benign, which is the image on the left, uh, just to back up, malignant nodes tend to be dark, well demarcated, and enlarged, uh, benign nodes tend to have this heterogeneous appearance. We see these all the time, and most of the time we ignore them. And honestly speaking, we ignore them in PSC patients too when they don't have a high suspicion, but if there is a suspicion, we should be sampling them is what they were, they were suggesting. Um, PSC and FISH, um, again, going back to that study from last December from the Mayo Clinic, what they found was that in the setting of PSC, fish generally tends to be less sensitive, and the reason is because it's being used as a screening test. So most patients will not have a fish positive test because patients are getting their brushings and that's all being sent for fish. Um, but in the setting of, of malignancy alone, fish tends to be more, more sensitive. Um, and then the second thing this, the, this showed was that if you have a mass lesion in the setting of PSC, then the sensitivity tends to be higher. If you have PSC without a mass, again, your, your, sensitiv your sensitivity of, of fish is low, again, in that 50% range, but slightly higher with their new panel. We're still left with that 50 to 60% mark, which is not ideal, but it's, in, you know, it's, it's some improvement. These uh, authors did a meta-analysis of the various modalities to see which study may necessarily be the best approach uh, for trying to evaluate um, for cholangiocarcinoma in the setting of PSC. So they compared bile duct brushing with cytology alone, fish polysomy, which is a more sort of older test, uh, fish trisomy, they did not use, the, they didn't have the data for the most recent panel, and then they compared it to spyglass. And the number of studies for cytology was the highest, of course, um, and for spy was the lowest, but in their opinion, um, based on their review of the data, the sensitivity for all these modalities was about 40 to 50 percent, and spy with directed biopsies had a higher sensitivity approaching maybe about 65 percent. Um, all these studies have to be taken into context. You know, this was published by a highly prolific advanced endoscopy group. So 
I mean, we just have to keep that in mind. I'm not saying that that's not the right approach, but uh, I think we do need more data. So is there an ideal approach? I'm honestly not sure. But this is what I tend to do, and I would, I think most people tend to do. Uh, check the CA99. If there's a concern for, for malignancy, obviously CT, MRI, MRCP as needed. EUS, if there's a concern for glandular carcinoma, um, Our Lady had one EUS about two months ago. I repeated the ERCP yesterday. I'm not sure we need to do another EUS, but at some point we may. <laughs> and then ERCP, we'll wait for the brush biopsies. Uh, our brush biopsies were negative. Uh, fish, so the, the issue with the fish is that I talked to our pathologist here at uh, UCSF, and it sounds like, and I'm willing to be corrected on this, but it sounds like they only send it out if it's abnormal cytology. So if it's normal cytology, they will not send it, which makes sense because the chances of fish being positive are lower in that setting. Um, but nowadays, maybe considering switching over to clangioscopy sooner rather than later, considering the improvement in quality as well as the ease with which it can be used. Previously, with the previous version, it took us an hour just to get an image. Now the resolution is better and we can quickly just plug in the scope and take a look. What about other, moving on, what about other therapeutic procedures for patients with liver disease? Um, ERCP for bile duct stones, bottom line is it can be done. We don't have to cut the sphincter, we can dilate the sphincter, we can take them out. I didn't get into too many details about this, but anything that is, can be done with cutting a sphincter nowadays can be done without cutting a sphincter. If the risk is pancreatitis, we can protect the pancreas by putting in a pancreatic stent, do large balloon dilation of the orifice and take out stones. Um, ERCP for cholecystitis. Um, in the previous role that I had at, in Minnesota, we used to do this a lot for our advanced liver disease patients where we would put in ERCP guided transpapillary stents into the gallbladder and, uh, and reduce the risk of uh, cholecystitis being a, a comorbidity that uh, may lead to their demise. I was fascinated by Jen's talk. One of my sort of, sort of the things that I've learned here, coming here, is firstly I'm meeting people that I haven't actually met yet, which is great. And then also this, this whole approach to the, the, the frailty of liver disease patients. And that was an issue that we also faced a lot there. And the, the way that we got around it to a degree in terms of at least the nutrition was to be able to offer a G-tube even in patients with liver disease and ascites. And the way we would do that is do a paracentesis first, decompress the abdomen as much as possible, do a feeding tube like a G-tube, and then actually suture the gastric wall to the abdominal, the, the, gas, the stomach wall to the uh, abdominal wall by using a laparoscopic suturing, uh, suture placement device. Uh, we would do four quadrant sutures. You can use T fasteners, and the idea is that you can actually help them a lot. My single side on liver transplantation, will I'll, I'll sort of speed it up here, is just to say that we have come a long way in the last 10 to 15 years in terms of technology, stents, and uh, wires, and pretty much are able to navigate through any kind of stricture as long as we can get to the orifice. The ruin wires tend to be more challenging, but we can achieve that. In living donors, um, we, with the higher sort of failure rate that's been reported traditionally in the literature, um, in, the, in the five years, we looked at our data from Minnesota, which was published recently, um, but the, the five years, in the previous five years, we had not failed a single um, stent or, or achieving the goal of uh, getting across a stricture or a leak um, in that population. So evolving in future technologies, EUS seems to be really leading the way here. Um, gastric variceal hem hemorrhage treatment, liver biopsy, and I can imagine liver specialists cringing here. Uh, portal pressure gradient measurement, again, and tips. Uh, here's obviously, I'm sure you guys are all aware with the different classification of gastric varices. The ones that uh, really uh, sort of need attention in terms of EUS, or may deserve attention, I should say, are the GOV2s and the isolated uh, gastric varices because the GOV1s can be treated similar to uh, esophageal varices alone. And IGV2s are, are very, very um, uncommon. But again, we as advanced endoscopists tend to get carried away with what we can do. Um, 
uh, and we have to realize that we are just one approach and, and BRTO, which is a second approach, which is uh, a percutaneous approach in patients who, who may have large gastrorenal shunts, whereby if I start putting coils and glue through the stomach side into the varix, and the glue is just going to embolize and cause major issues, maybe we should be assessing for that before we start coiling these patients. So the, the key point here is that it, it, there are various approaches, and ours is just one. Having said that, there is a very nice um, sort of um, publication in GIE by the CPMC group who have been really the leaders in this field, um, not just in the country but in the world. So, so this is an exciting field for all of us in the field of advanced endoscopy. Um, biopsies, all I'll say is that there's a significant shift in the field of EUS to moving from fine needle aspiration biops needles to actual biopsy needles where we're getting chunks of tissue. And so that has been extended to patients with liver disease. If you're doing an EUS in a patient with unexplained elevated LFTs to look for bile duct stones, the argument is, well, while you're there, why not do a liver biopsy? Counter argument is, why do it when somebody else can do it percutaneously? Um, and I, I'm not necessarily advocating for doing liver biopsies, but there is definitely a role that can be considered. The studies that have been done are early, and they've only looked at patients with normal INRs, you know, not high-risk patients. Honestly speaking, I think the role that we can play more is in those high-risk patients where we can actually, I personally feel, and I have no data to support this, that we will be able to do this safely in patients with elevated INRs, even up to two, two and a half. And if we have the capability of putting in coils, maybe we can close up our, our tract with a coil at the end of it so we don't actually increase the risk of a leak or a bleed from our, our coiling uh, of, from our biopsy site. Um, and this is really sort of exciting just conceptually, whether or not, you know, again, whether it should be considered or not is, uh, again, from California, UC Irvine, Dr. Chang, who's very prolific in the field of EUS, uh, using a mini probe uh, which can go through a 25 gauge needle to check the, the pressure inside the hepatic vein and the portal vein and then figuring out the pressure gradient using EUS guidance. So in conclusion, advanced endoscopy can play a, a and does play an important role in the management of patients with PSC and other obstructive diseases of the liver. Patients should be managed using a multidisciplinary approach involving primary care providers, gastroenterologists, hepatologists, surgery, radiology, and advanced endoscopy. Um, Non-invasive imaging should always sort of be done prior to, for, to us sort of embarking on EUS and ERCP. And finally, improvements in ERCP technology and EUS technologies um, are really pushing this field into an exciting area where we are doing diagnostics and therapeutics. Thank you for your attention. This is really interesting. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Questions? So, um, quick question about PSC is a fascinating area. Um, so, can you give us an estimate about uh, the increase in diagnostic yield of spyglass with biopsy over, say, brushing plus or minus fish? Mm -hmm. That, that meta-analysis that was, I can go back and show you, that meta-analysis quoted about a 60% yield in the setting of cholangiocarcinoma, 60% uh, sensitivity. If you look at the newest probe from Mayo, they're quoting 62. Um, I think we, our biggest limitation with SPI is going to be the size of the biopsy forceps. And the company is aware of that, and they're trying to, to address that. Um, so I think between Honestly speaking, I, I really don't think there's a significant difference in brush biopsy plus fish plus uh, spy, though it seems like we will be doing more of that till we figure out which approach, either one of these alone or incremental yield by adding the approaches helps. Um, you know, um, PSC patients, I mean, real problem in terms of making diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma, we're always challenged about that. But uh, they tend to lose weight. There's some non-invasive kind of, you know, clue to the diagnosis of cholangio. Mm -hmm. Like they're losing weight. They have abnormal CA99. Do you think there's a way to integrate some of these parameters into risk stratification? 
Absolutely. I think CA99 is one of those markers that um, has been used and shown again in, in that Mayo study was one of the independent factors for determining uh, the presence of cholangiocarcinoma. Weight loss may well be. Um, I think, you know, again, sort of echoing what was mentioned by J Jennifer, I think that those are all factors that we should study more. Um, I'll be honest that if, if there's data for weight loss as being a predictor for cholangiocarcinoma, um, feel free to tell me. <laughs> but uh, yes, absolutely, I think all those factors should be considered. And uh, we would like to keep the liver biopsy for the hepatologist for now. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks.